Hi, I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit Podcast. This is our second episode of a three-part series discussing the life and the poetry of John Donne. Last week, we introduced Donne, the man himself, uh, the concept he is most known for, which is the metaphysical conceit, and one of, if not his most famous poems, The Flea. Um, it's considered one of his mocking poems. Uh, of course, there were quite a few. And we argued that the poem is a criticism of courtly love and a mock serious parody of the art of seducing a woman at court. To put it in modern terms, uh, he's making fun of what today uh, in America we would call the hookup culture. Um, it's uh, mocking men who objectify women and mistakenly believe in themselves to be so charming and skilled that they can seduce a woman with something as repulsive as a flea. And <laughs> This episode, we explore an entirely different side of Dunn. And yes, there is more to him than irreverent sarcasm. We explore his sincere or his serious love poetry, and we read closely what was perhaps his second most widely read poem, A Valediction Forbidding Morning. Um, it, too, is a metaphysical conceit, so we'll revisit that term again, uh, but also meet the woman who perhaps was the real-life muse who inspired it. Well, I like to think she was. I mean, obviously, his understanding of love, although shaped in part by his experiences with Anne, was born out of the entirety of his life experiences, not just those that directly wait, relate to his wife. So let's pick up where we left off last episode in the personal story of John Donne, because his fate takes a turn. When we last left him, he was living his best life. He had studied law, languages, taken adventures across the continent, and then had settled into this cushy post as secretary to Sir Thomas Edgerton, who was the Lord Keeper of England. Gary, who is Sir Thomas Edgerton? And what might a Lord Keeper of England do? I mean, that is some kind of title, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what does that title mean? Well, Sir Thomas Edgerton was a big deal. Uh, first, he was a Viscount, which is the fourth of five ranked titles in the peerage system. Um, the Viscount is ranked below Duke and Marquess and Earl, uh, but he's up ranked above the Baron. So just having a title means really having a position of power and influence. Um, but in Sir Thomas Edgerton's case, he became Lord Keeper of the Great Seal and held that position for 21 years, which was something that had never happened before. Now, uh, the Lord Keeper is an officer of the English Crown charged with the physical custody of the Great Seal of England. Um, it's a position of trust and power. And, and I want to point out that because of Dunn's association in these prestigious circles, he himself rose in importance, uh, even serving as a member of Parliament in the final gathering of Parliament under Queen Elizabeth I in 1601. And, uh, however, in December of uh, 1601, Dunn made a decision that changed everything. It not only got him dismissed from his position, but also landed him in prison. <laughs> He must have known he was taking a huge risk because he did it secretly. But in December of 1601, at age 29, Dunn married the 17-year-old niece of Lady Edgerton and more. Um, in other words, he married his boss's wife's niece, if you can follow that. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, And that was not well received by the family. Anne's father, Sir George Moore, Lady Edgerton's brother, not only had Dunn thrown into the Fleet Prison, which was a nasty, lice-infested, filthy place until the marriage question got sorted out, Anne's father at first tried to get the marriage annulled, but eventually he relinquished and allowed the marriage. And um, However, he refused to give his daughter her dowry, and uh, Dunn never got his job back, so with no job... And no dowry from his new bride. Even after getting out of prison, the Duns would live in abject poverty for the next 15 years. And that would be the price of love. <laughs> well, I, I do want to point out that even in prison, Dunn had his wits about him. There's this famous epigram where he described their marriage. Here it is. John Dunn and Dunn undone. <laughs> you know, I've read that he wrote that line in prison, but I'm not really sure it's true. I've also read that he chalked it out on the back of the door on the day that they eloped. Either way, it's 
basically around the same time. And obviously it didn't take Dunn long to know that he was in trouble, real trouble for offending his boss, his in-laws, never mind, you know, civil and religious laws of the day. (laughs) Well, in fact, uh, that they was secretly somewhat implies that they knew they were doing something that would get them in trouble. I would think so. (laughs) But it's hard to know if they knew how much trouble they were getting into. Oh, I agree. And after it all came out, it was on Dunn to use his wit and his eloquence to get back in the good graces of his in-laws. And so, among other things, he wrote these letters to his father-in-law appealing for his life and for his marriage. The letters must have done something because on April 27th, 1602, the court of the Archbishop of Canterbury confirmed the marriage. However... Since Anne's father still refused to release her dowry and he couldn't get his position back, that didn't help their financial situation. And so they ended up, you know, really living in bad poverty until 1609. Then the relationship with the father-in-law restored. Uh, They got some of the dowry back or they did get the dowry back. But Gary, let's read a little bit of one of Don's apology letters just to get a flavor you know, for all this went down, a lot of these letters we still have. Uh, they're proudly owned by the Folgers Shakespeare Library, and you can see facsimiles of them online. They're very sincere. So, Gary, in your most apologetic voice, read for us uh, what he said. Sir, if I could fear that in so much worthiness as is in you, there were no mercy, or if these weights oppressed only my shoulders and my fortunes and not my conscience and hers— Whose good is dearer to me by much than my life, I should not thus trouble you with my letters. But when I see that this storm hath shaken me at root in my Lord's favor where I was well planted, and have just reason to fear that those ill reports which malice hath raised of me may have troubled her, I can leave no honest way untried to remedy these miseries, nor find any way more honest than this, out of a humble and repentant heart, for the fault done to you to beg both your pardon and assistance in my suite to the Lord. I mean, he most certainly is appealing to his father's compassion for his own daughter as well as himself. So, you know, Christy, was there's a story of true love. I like to think that it was. Of course, we don't know because we don't have anything from Anne's perspective in the Rick and Redeker to kind of tell how she felt about how things were going. But what we do have is Dunn's a pretty significant collection of sincere love poems. And what we see in these poems is a definition of love that is very opposite the courtly love tradition that was in mode at the time. But it's also the opposite of platonic love. He defines romantic love as both physical and spiritual. You know, we brought this up last episode. There's a lot of poetry at the time that was objectifying women, admiring them for sure. But in some sense, it was not personalizing them. So we have that going on. But then on the other hand, there's this other vision of platonic love and this idea that love is spiritual. It's not carnal in any way. But doing that also creates a distance between persons. And Don did not ascribe to either one of these understandings. Don spent a lot of time thinking about the relationship between a man and a woman. I mean, he was cast out of society because of it. So you cannot read his poetry and not understand that he most definitely believed in physical and spiritual intimacy as a single thing, as opposed to, you know, casual sexual encounters on the one hand or platonic relationships of a brotherly nature, maybe, on the other. The poem, the canonization, has widely been interpreted as Dunn describing his own personal experience with Anne. Of course, we don't know that that's really what the poem is about, because he never explicitly said, this is me talking about my wife. But if you know his story, it just stands to reason. The poem opens up with the speaker fussing at someone who has demeaned him for giving up wealth and advancement for love. I mean, does that sound familiar? (laughs) You know, I know we've said that the poet isn't always the same as the speaker, but it's hard to imagine that his experiences at this moment are not presenting a perspective that we see in the poem. So let's read it. The canonization. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love or chide my palsy or my gout. My five gray hairs or ruined fortune flout, with wealth your state, your mind with arts improve. 
take you a course, get you a place, observe his honor or his grace, or the king's real or his stamped face, contemplate what you will approve, so you will let me love. You know, when you read Dunn's poems, you see that they're kind of aggressive. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. You know, this is different than a lot of the poetry at the time, because this whole poem, it's a defense of the speaker's decision to love at any cost. The poem obviously is longer. We're, we don't have time to read the whole thing, but I want to jump back in in the third stanza, because in the third stanza, he compares himself and the one that he loves to the phoenix, which is that bird that rises out of the ashes. I mean, they died in a sense, but then together they rise again by love. Let's read that stanza. Call us what you will, we are made such by love. Call her one, me another fly. We're tapers too, and at our own cost die. And we in us find the eagle and the dove. The phoenix riddle hath more wit by us. We too, being one, are it. So, to one neutral thing both sexes fit. We die and rise the same and prove mysterious by this love. You know what Dunn has done, uh, no one had ever done before. There's my Dunn poem. Yeah, that's a lot of Dunn's <laughs> there. I know. Uh, but what he's done is he's redefined what love is, at least for poetry. I'm not saying that people didn't feel this way, but they weren't writing like that. But this relationship between a man and a woman was really different. And it appears to use uh, words in this poem, their love to others was mysterious. It proves mysterious. I mean, in the courtly tradition, love was very public. It's something that you showed off at court. A poet addresses his love in front of an audience. Dunn's poems define love very differently. Of course, this doesn't sound original to us because since him, lots of other people has followed his lead. But he was really the first to say, love is not public. And my relationship with you is not for public consumption. Love is private. Something is, it's intimate. It's between two people. And if it's real, they can use their love, their relationship as a shield to protect themselves from the cruel forces of the world. They can reinvent themselves like the Phoenix. There's an equality present in his love that is very different from this worshipful nature of courtly love. Whereas at love, love at court, you can think of it, it was a game. For Dunn, love was none of your business. You know, another one of his best loved love poems is called The Good Morrow. Uh, in this poem, he starts by saying, I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we loved. The idea of this poem is that a man and a woman are waking up in a world together. And what they understand is that their love makes the entire world shrink through their bedroom. At that moment, it's this microcosm. It's just the two of them. They are the entire world. They're at least each other's entire world. And in each other, they find safety and novelty and an adventure. And they, I'm going to read it to you in a second. And you'll see that he talks about each other being reflected and seeing themselves in each other's eyes. I mean, it's very sweet. So let, let me read it. And now, good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear. For love, all love of other sights controls and makes one little room in everywhere. Let sea discoverers to new worlds have gone. Let maps to other worlds on worlds have shown. Let us possess one world, each hath one and is one. My face and thine eye, thine and mine appears. And true plain hearts do in the faces rest where we can find two better hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west. And let me remind you that this is the age of discovery when he's writing. Um, the world had been turned upside down, literally, with uh, Copernicus's discovery of, that the earth revolved around the sun. I mean, 
the world was big and unmapped and everything science had been saying for years was now gone and rearranged. Everything was uncertain now. And, you know, uh, Rene Descartes famously said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, it's a famous line because it's what everyone felt. I mean, I have no idea what is real and what isn't real anymore. In fact, I'm pretty sure nothing is real. It sounds pretty much an existential crisis. Right? <laughs> well, knowing that the world wasn't what you thought would be. Right. Literally. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't trust my eyes to define truth for me anymore. I can't trust scientists to know truth. Uh, they're collectively wrong. I mean, so how can uh, I even know if I am true? And you know, my my only center for truth is that I can think. And so therefore, at least uh, I can know that I think. Therefore, I am. And, you know, Dunn plays on those ideas. Um, but for Dunn, relationships help define us. And that's how we can know. And I've noticed in uh, many of his poems, he uses all this imagery of maps and globes and finding a center and direction. And for Dunn, we see this corresponding idea to Descartes. Well, I love, therefore I am. And you are. Exactly right. And and isn't that exactly what happens when you love someone and they love you back? I mean, it gives you orientation. I want to read just one more snippet from another popular Dunn love poem. This one's called The Sun Rising. Busy old fool, unruly sun, why dost thou thus through my windows and through curtains call on us? Must to thy motions lovers seasons run? Saucy, pedantic wretch, Go chide late schoolboys and sour apprentices. Go tell courts hutsmans and the king will ride. Call country ants to harvard offices. Love all alike, no season, nose, nor clime, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. You know, again, you know, he's talking to someone. This is a literary device we call an apostrophe. An apostrophe? You mean like, like the punctuation mark? Uh, well, the word's the same, but it's a type <laughs> of figurative language. An apostrophe is when you address someone who can't talk back. Either they're not there or they're not real, which is what we have here. He's talking to the son. Uh, so, and, of course, the son can't talk back, obviously. So it's an apostrophe. But since the son is an object and not a person, it's representing something else. He calls the son unruly, a busy old fool. He's personifying it as a way of, of kind of letting it symbolize the outside world. It's this idea that two lovers, their private world is being invaded by the sun, by the outside, by school, the office, the king. He calls the sun a wretch and tells it to chide someone else. You know, to chide, that means to fuss at or to scold. He says this, love all alike, no season, nose, nor climb. Climb is the ancient word. That means a section of the globe. Nor hours, days, months are the rags of time. I mean, the sun represents society, but together with just the two of them, love is timeless. Love stops time. It knows no season, no space or time. I mean, it's a very interesting metaphor. Hours, days, months they're the rags of time. You know, time is not your friend in this metaphor. It's not dressed in something sweet or beautiful. Time is worthless scraps. Time is not my friend when I'm with the one I love. I mean, again, it's so sweet. And, and everyone loves a feeling loved and being with the person that you love. And time isn't your friend. I mean, it can only take that person away from you. I think it's interesting that he doesn't use the word marriage anywhere in these serious poems. Uh, Dunn is discussing a relationship that is private but not defined by anything from the outside, even if it's something sacred, as marriage is in the Christian tradition. And, but in Dunn's poetry, love is private. Marriage, by its very definition, is public, even today. I mean, marriage is community-oriented. Um, it's a legal arrangement. And you know, in those days, more so even than today, because it wasn't necessarily about the two people as individuals. It was about the two families that were merging. I mean, it was political. It was contractual. Uh, and Dunn creates little kingdoms that are uh, outside of all of this, outside society, outside even time itself. Exactly. And, and of course, that's how intoxicating romantic love feels at its best. I mean, these poems are about those feelings, about romantic love. Later on in that same poem, listen to how Dunn describes his beloved. She's all states and all princes. I nothing else is. 
Princes do but play us. Compared to this, all honors a mimic, all wealth alchemy. Thou, son, art half as happy as we, and that the world's contracted thus. Well, you know, if these love declarations were all for her, um, you know, that certainly paints a picture of a, a wonderfully close relationship. <laughs> I know. That's why I like to think of them that way. It's also, you know, empowering, especially for the woman in the poem at a time when women were essentially commodities, things that were traded by family members. And, you know, I don't want to give the impression that all of his poems are as noble as the ones that, you know, I were highlighting here. He most definitely wrote poems that were body and, and, and so descriptive, you know, we can't read them on the podcast. And, and some of them didn't even come out on the first edition of his books for the same reason. Um, like I've said more than once, we absolutely don't know when and for what reason any of his poems were written because they weren't published. But what we do know is that Anne was pregnant pretty much all the time. Uh, Dunn traveled quite a bit trying to rebuild his career, and he was absent for almost the whole time that she was pregnant. And these were dangerous days to be pregnant. Well, Christy, I mean, can you imagine this? Um, Anne gave birth to 12 children. I mean, that was back in the day when if they couldn't get a, a baby out, they put a hook in its mouth and pulled it out. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. I, I cannot imagine. And I know for a fact that I would have died the first time that happened to me. I know that because... Um, when my first daughter was born, it took 23 hours of labor and a C-section. I mean, women like me didn't survive 12 right. <laughs> or one. <laughs> Amazing. You know, uh, but also for, for John's part, going away was also a dangerous venture. I mean, every time you left the country, uh, be it on horseback or, or in a boat, there, there were endless ways your life could end, you know, by disease or violence or accident. Sometime later, likely when Anne was about 27 years old, Dunn left Anne and their children to accompany his patron, Sir Robert Drury, on a diplomatic mission in France. It appears that Anne was sad that he was leaving, and Dunn's first biographer, Isaac Watson, who knew Dunn personally, was his contemporary uh, when he wrote the book. He claims that Dunn wrote the poem that we're getting ready to read in 1611 for his wife, a valediction, forbidden mourning. He wrote it as a farewell speech to Anne. Well, you know, if we take Walton's word on the context of the poem, um, sadly, Anne was right to be distressed at his departure. Uh, one of her stillborn births occurred while he was on that trip. You know, many critics and readers in general really consider this poem to be one of the most romantic poems in English. So many lovers have read it, and they've related to it. But again, he didn't write it to be published, and he didn't write it for others to relate to it. It was private. It wasn't published until after his death, where it was included in the collection titled Songs and Sonnets. Uh, well, here's a fun fact. Um, today, the earliest surviving collection of Dunn's poetry, uh, the one published with the help of Dunn's son, who is also named John Dunn, um, it can still be purchased online. <laughs> okay. For the bargain price of fifty-eight to fifty-nine thousand dollars, depending on the seller. So there you go. <laughs> to all the lovers out there, here's your next Valentine's Day gift idea. <laughs> and the songs and sonnets, the uh, the book, all the poems build rhetorically on Dunn's take on this love theme. Dunn believed a relationship between a man and a woman was physical and sensual as well as spiritual. And, and that's a thread that we can see in all of the love poetry that he writes. And this poem presupposes that idea. It assumes this Christian understanding of marriage that when a man and a woman come together, there is a spiritual element of oneness that comes through the physical relationship. And this is altogether unique and special and cannot really easily be broken. So we'll read the poem stanza by stanza so that we can understand um, Dunn's understanding. This, like many of his poems, contains a conceit. Again, a conceit is an extended metaphor. It's strange. It's an awkward comparison that extends across the poem. In this case, Dunn will compare love to a compass. And I'm not talking about the compass that hunters put in their pockets so they can find their way. That would actually make more sense. He compares love, 
the love that he and his wife shared to the kind of compass that we might use in geometry class or as an architect or maybe an art class to make circles. It's that little tool that has two little metal bars that connect at the top and one stretches out and the other stays erect. So that's how you draw these perfect circles that are different sizes. The title of the poem is A Valediction forbidding mourning. Now the word valediction isn't a common word. Most of us associate the word with graduation ceremonies because at a graduation, like a high school graduation, uh, the person that's at the top of the class that has the highest GPA is invited to give the valediction and they are called the valedictorian. But the valediction means the farewell address. So in this poem, the word valediction it's followed by a colon. In other words, my farewell address, colon, forbidding mourning. The farewell address is to forbid the person to be sad because this other person is leaving. And the poem is an argument as to why the person should not be sad because the person he or she loves is leaving. <laughs> that seems like a tough sell to me. Yes, but it's his argument and he's going to make it. So let's read it. As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now and some say no. So let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempest move, twere profanation of our days to tell the laity our love. And so his first claim is that we don't need to cry when I leave. And to support this claim he begins with an analogy my leaving you should be treated the same as when good people face death when virtuous men die they don't scream instead they go peacefully to god their friends may be sad and not want them to leave but they themselves don't act like that they go in peace and the reason that virtuous people go in peace is because they anticipate the resurrection they're not dying they're not leaving forever. They're coming back. And because there's hope, there's no sorrow there. So this is going to be the hook on which the entire argument rests. And so he's going to say, you and I are like that. We're like righteous people looking towards their encounter with God, toward the resurrection. Let us melt and make no noise, he goes on to say, would profane our relationship to expose our private joys publicly like that. Once again, you see Dunn making it clear that their relationship is not for public consumption. He doesn't want it to be exposed, not even by tears at a departure. So Gary, with those ideas in mind, let's go back and reread the first two stanzas, and then let's continue on to the next ones, which are a little more complicated as he goes into outer space to develop his argument. <laughs> As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say no. So let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempest move, to our profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. Moving to the earth brings harms and fears, men reckon what it did and meant, but trepidation of the spheres, thou greater far, is innocent." Dull subluminary lovers love whose soul is sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. Again, there's this idea of privacy. He says the movement of the earth brings harms and fears. In other words, where there are earthquakes, everyone freaks out. But that's because it's an earthly event. Our relationship is not earthly. It's out we're outer worldly, maybe divine. It's greater when, when things move in space, even though that's a much bigger deal, much bigger in scope. Nobody knows about the, you know, the blasts that are going on in space. He says, that's like our love. Our, this, this is like, it can't, it's not like sublunary lovers love. And that's a big word. Sublunary. It's a fancy word. Sub means beneath. Luna means the, the moon. So he's saying sublunary, you know, earthly, the kind of love that people have below the moon. He says that's like, that's, here's the comparison. Those relationships are just physical. 
but when so when one of the parties is out of sight or absent, the relationship is kind of over because the relationship is physical. It's sublinary. But he's going to say our relationship, although it is physical, it's not only physical. Listen to how he describes their relationship. It is not sublinary. <laughs> But we, by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is, enter assured of the mind, care less, eyes, lips, and hands to miss. Our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure, not yet, a breach, but an expansion like gold to airy thinness beat. Again, here's a third comparison. When he alludes to the word, he actually, he alluded to this when he used the word melt in the beginning of the poem. Uh, But here he's going to go back again. He's going to say, our relation is like alchemy. It's almost magical. It's like gold. It's refined. Our souls stretch like gold stretches. Our love doesn't break when we're apart. It expands. It's like fine gold. It just expands. It can stretch a long way and not break. If they be two, they are two so, as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth, if the other do. And there you go, that famous conceit. We are a compass. You are the center of the compass, the fixed foot, and I'm the other foot that moves. And though it in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it and grows erect as that comes home. He's saying, as I go farther out, notice how the compass leans in the direction of the foot. It leans and it hearkens. Hearkens means to cause. It it calls or you calls and you draw me back. Such wilt thou be to me who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I begun. And of course, this final comparison brings up the fact that a compass makes a circle, a complete circle, which is a symbol of perfection. I mean, in this poem, the lovers are separate, but inextricably and perfectly bound to each other, assuring an eventual reunion, a resurrection of sorts. I mean, it's the assurance that even though I know I'm going No, I'm coming back. And wherever I go, you're there because you're a part of me. Again, very sweet. You know, it wasn't but a few years after this voyage that Don was persuaded by King James to enter the ministry. Um, And in 1616, he was appointed a royal chaplain. And, you know, things started to come around and were improving professionally and financially. And But then in 1617, and gave birth to another stillborn child, but this time, five days later, she herself died, and she was only 33 years old, and her death broke Dunn's heart, and according to Dunn's biographer, uh, Isaac Walton, her death, and I quote Walton here, left Dunn crucified to the world. I mean, he expressed his grief in the famous Holy Sonnet 17, and Dunn would never again write a love poem after that. And here is Holy Sonnet 17. Since she whom I loved hath paid her last debt to nature, and to hers and my good is dead, her soul early into heaven ravished, holy on heavenly things my mind is set. Here the admiring her my mind did wet to seek thee, God, so streams to show thy head. But though I have found thee, and thou my thirst hast fed, A holy thirsty dropsy melts me yet. But why should I beg more love when as thou dost woo my soul for hers offering all thine and dost not only fear lest I allow my love to saints and angels things divine, but in thy tender jealousy dost doubt lest the world flesh, yea, devil put thee out. And so the satirist, the humorist, the love poet changes courses, and from this point onward, his writing would be devoted to God, and his later poems and sermons would concern themselves with, um, among other Christian themes, the love of God and the experience of death. And 
In the next episode, we will uh, highlight a few of his famous holy sonnets and, of course, one of his most influential sermons, the one from which we get a couple of quotes. No man is an island and, of course, for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. So, again, thank you for listening today. We uh, hope you enjoyed listening to this discussion of John Donne's most famous love poetry. And we also hope you come back and uh, finish with us our discussion of this famous and thought-provoking poet turned Christian minister. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can check out our uh, other over 250 episodes. Also, uh, whether you're listening on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or any other podcast platform, We also hope you can come back and finish with us our discussion of this famous and thought-provoking poet-turned-Christian minister. Um, If you enjoyed this episode, check out our other over 250 episodes. You can check us out on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or any other podcast platform. Uh, Don't forget, you can also find us and connect with us at howtolovelitpodcast.com. On our website, you're going to find listening guides for most of our episodes, as well as other teaching resources. Please subscribe to our podcast, and if you enjoy what we do, give us a rating. And if you have a minute, even a review. It's when you share the podcast that we grow. And lastly, thank you for supporting us in our mission to make reading great literature accessible and enjoyable to as many people as possible. Peace out. Peace out.